All right. So corporate bond spreads, you're going to use this on that question. So we said you have a 20 year bond that was issued 15 years ago and it's when it was issued. So what, first of all, it's a 20 year bond issued, or let's say 30 year bond issued 20 years ago, 30 year bond issued 10 years, 20 years ago. So what kind of bond is it? It's a 10 year. Yeah. All you care is what's left. What if it was issued at triple A rating, but now it's triple B plus? What spread are you gonna use? So 150, right? And what is that 150? 150 basis points. A few of y'all on paper two are still struggling with what a basis points is. Some people were saying they beat earnings per share by 32 basis points, what I meant 32 cents. So they beat, and that doesn't make any sense. We don't use basis points when we're talking about earnings. And why is that? You don't need basis points for earnings because earnings are in what? They're in dollars, right? So if it's in dollars, you don't need basis points. You don't need basis points on gross margin. Why do we use basis points on gross margin? Because it's a percent, okay? So get comfortable with that. So this is 150 basis points or 1.5%. And we talked about the term structure or credit spreads. That'd be great if you're interviewing for a bond job, that'd be a great term to bring in. That sounds pretty sophisticated. You notice the spreads widen as you go out. So there's a term structure to credit spreads. Um, and I can't find the Moody study for some reason. I don't know why, but um, here's the S&P, it's out there. Uh, you can see how big 2008 was. This is a number of issues. I like it better in dollars. You can see the huge impact. In fact, if you look at number of defaults, it looks like the 2000 crisis and the 2008 crisis are about the same. But when you look at it in dollars, 2000 was about the itty bitty dot com companies that went under and they weren't all that big. In 2008, it was AIG, uh, General Motors, you know, it was some pretty massive firms. So somewhere in here, they have a transition matrix, but I never could find it. I really wanted to show you a transition matrix, but it's in here somewhere. I mean, it's, it's 239 pages. I mean, that's pretty interesting in itself, the default rates by year. So if you look at 2008, you'll see more defaults, but still the double A's and the triple A's, no defaults. Defaults really are on the, on the down, the low rating. That's some really good stuff. I can find the translation. If they have one, it's easy to find because they're, they, uh, so there's the one year transition. Let's, I want to look at the five year. Well, here's one. This is what I showed you. Boy, this is a really, really critical room right here. Can y'all see that? So this is the cumulative and I like the 10 years. So this looks real similar to that chart I showed you. Triple A bonds, the cumulative default rate is 0.7% over 10 years. You divide that by 10, that's 0.07%, that's seven basis points. So if a triple A bond pays you seven basis point spread, you're covered for your defaults, but what is this missing? What else do you get? So you have defaults, but are you gonna lose that? You remember what I talked about, the recovery rate? You might get half of your money back. So, you know, three or four basis points might be all you need for a triple B, triple A bond because they just don't lose much money at all. It's pretty rare. I don't know what this issue right here is, but then the triple A and double A are almost the same. So why buy triple A? Just buy double A. You're going to get more spread and your risk of loss is probably about the same. And then they start dropping pretty dramatically, right? You can see the huge drop between triple B and double B where you go to low investment grade and then single B and investment society, we're, we're getting our buy list for stocks. And one of the things I tell them, so their buy list might have 15 stocks on it. I tell them, hey, if it's single B rated or lower, I don't want to touch it. Single B to me is just, that's just too risky. One fourth of them are going to go out of business. I don't even touch it. Triple C, any of y'all want to buy a triple C bond over half of them are going to default. And your recovery rates is going to be much, much lower, right? There's not much there to cover you. So this is a great table right here, and this goes through 2020. So this is something I would be carrying in my wallet. If I was interviewing in a bond firm, I would, I would just have this column memorized. 
about 1% of triple and double A go under, about 1.2% of single A, about 3% of triple B. You know, I would just have those numbers memorized. So, I mean, you know, someone says, hey, the spread on triple B is um, 150 basis points. What does this number tell you? You need about 32 basis points to cover your default defaults and you can get some of that back. 150 basis points sounds like a really good spread, doesn't it? On average, you're gonna lose less than 32 basis points and you're getting paid 150 basis points a year. Sounds pretty powerful. Uh, all right, so there it is. That's a, that's a good one there. Um, by region, I don't know what they mean by region, but but I still haven't found the transition transition matrix, but I know it's in here, but with 239 pages and I'm only on page uh, 60 something, it's, it's in here something somewhere. But what the five-year transition matrix does, which I really like, it shows you that a bond that's rated AAA today, what's the percentage and what's the chance in five years they'll still be AAA? What's the probability that be double A, single A? I like that matrix. Because there's two risks. We talked about this in our risk management class. There's two risks when you buy a corporate bond. One is default risk that they just stop paying you. But the other is what we call downgrade risk. What are spreads going to do if your bond's downgraded? You're downgraded from single A to triple B. What happens to your spread? Do they widen or narrow? We're going to widen. So that means the price is going to fall. So that's called downgrade risk. So downgrade risk is a different risk than default risk. And we have to look at both of those. Now, the other thing bond investors talk about is event risk. And that's where management gets together, borrows a lot of money and does a... Uh, uh, a buyout of the firm and leverages up with a lot of debt that's called invent risk and then the bond goes from single a rated to like single b rated overnight that's like a disaster for bond investors so those are the main credit risks that people are worried about um, but moody's and s p provide tremendous amount of information this says transition but it's only a one year i don't want to see the one year transition i want to see the five year but it's in here somewhere I probably could do a search on five. Yeah, it's just there's 26 things with five in it. So it's it's in there. It's in there somewhere. I want it in the title. So yeah, it's it's not. Okay, it's it's in there. I'll find it one of these days. Um, that's why if you're more quantitative, more mathematical, bonds just feel so much better because there's so much data in detail that you can get your hands on. And the data is really good. It's real rich. Um, not so much on the stock side. All right. So let's switch the stocks then. <laughs> so with the stock, I, I stole this from Dr. Demodera and I really like this. So you're going to value a stock. He says there's there's four things you've got to do. First thing, you got to come up with a discount rate. That's your paper three. We're going to talk about paper three here. Again, we've already done it because we talked about beta. So I'll but I'll do it again. But you got to come up with a discount rate. The discount rate is going to reflect the risk you see in the firm. We're going to use beta to assess that risk. But there are other models we talk about, but we we'll use beta. So you have to come up with some discount rate reflects the risk. You then need to value the firm based on what its existing is doing. What's the firm value as is? And I'll show you a formula I use for that. It's a formula Dan Darren doesn't like, but I like it. What's the current as of firm? So if Walmart, what is Walmart worth if they never built another store? Never added any more square feet, just their existing business, didn't expand overseas, didn't do more online. Then you got to figure out what's the value of growth. So they do add new stores, they do expand, they have new business. What's the value of that growth? And then you got to figure out when does all that growth stop and they just go to a steady state. So their existing business and their growth, their growth is zero and they just have the existing business. And we assume all firms do that. Dan Madarin has a great, great video on the life cycle of businesses. You should really watch it. He talks about how young firms that try to act like old firms and really mess up. And old firms try to act like young firms, they really mess up. 
but there's every firm has a second. You may say, well, not Google. Google will always be a fast growing company. Well, I don't, I don't think so. I think once you hit $2 trillion in market cap, it becomes really difficult to grow fast. You kind of run out of ideas, right? What's the most they can do is they can have a product with every single person in the world. Then they come up with another product. Can any firm really do that? How many of y'all are rushing out to buy Apple products right now? I don't know how many Apple watches there are in here, but is there something Apple can do that will really get you excited? So they're getting into healthcare. That's kind of interesting, but they're going to eventually run out of ideas. You know, just, the Apple card. Huh? The Apple card. Apple card. But how much money does Apple make off the Apple card? That's not a particularly <laughs> profitable business for Apple. So it's, it's interesting. We'll see. Can they keep coming up with ideas that really, really work? Um, so every firm, we assume every firm at some point is going to come to some steady state. At some point, they've got every single possible customer they can get. I mean, is it possible for Netflix to have 12 billion customers? If there's going to be 10 billion people in the world, pretty unlikely. Is it possible they have a whole new service they could say everybody? Oh, that's but uh, at some point, your growth is going to be population growth plus inflation. That's about all you can get. You know, especially if you're Best Buy or Walmart, you know, eventually if you're selling everybody, what else are you going to do? So those are the pieces we come up with. We'll come up with the discount rate in paper three. And then we're going to spend a lot of time talking about growth in paper four. That's where the bulk of your paper four is. What growth rate are you going to use? Uh, and then you just discount all of that. So it's really a matter of coming up with how fast your firm's going to grow off of the base of what they currently do. And then when does that growth stop? When that growth stops, what's that firm worth as it just as is? Another word for this is terminal growth. I don't ever call it steady state, but terminal growth, you may have heard that term before. This is what it is. This is what the valuation of stocks is. Um, so intrinsic value is a magnitude of expected cash flows and the asset over its lifetime, adjusted for the risk of the uncertainty. Um, and he says, you've got to be consistent here. If it does not affect the cash flows or alter risk, then it has no value. Now, I know the ESG people don't like that. But if ESG doesn't affect the cash flow finances, it's not worth anything. Now, does a firm addressing global warming have an impact on cash flows? Yeah, definitely. But what impact does it have? That's what you have to figure out. Does it affect the risk of the company? I love, my first boss in finance, oh man, it's smart, smart, smart man. But he says, there's two ways you increase the value of the firm. You increase their cash flows or reduce their risk. And that's what David Darren's saying. Does it affect their cash flows? Does it affect their risk? If your answer to that is no, then it has nothing to do with value. It might be important. You may, you may value it, but it has nothing to do with the value of the stock. Uh, the duh, it, proposition for an asset to have value, the expected cash flows have to be positive sometime over the life of the asset. So there's firms with negative cash flows. At some point, they've got to go positive or the firm's not worth anything. You say, yeah, but they're growing really, really fast. So, yeah, but if they never make money, growing really fast is actually kind of bad, right? Does it make lose more money? So Tesla finally went to positive earnings, right? But how long could Tesla have gone losing money? And people can say this has some value. Amazon lost money for the longest time. And then finally they turned that around. But at some point, if you got a firm, and I'm not going to allow you to do a firm with negative earnings on paper four, you've got to have positive earnings. So we're doing more stable firms. Firms with negative earnings today are really, really hard to value. Essentially, what you just got to do is you got to grow their revenues and then figure out once their revenues get to some point, what will their margins be at that point? You got to cover all those fixed costs, but you've got to eventually make money. And don't freak out. Assets that generate cash flows early in their life will be worth more than assets that generate cash flows later. So we may love growth, but we love cash. So if they got low cash flows today, they better be growing fast because I can go get huge cash flows from Microsoft right now. That's a piece of cake. All right. <clears throat> All right. So I'm stealing this from Dan Madera, and I forget which presentation he did this. He has several videos that are just, you should just go on YouTube and watch every single one of his videos because they're, they're quite exceptional. He's a very, very good speaker. Um, 
All right, so what are we gonna do? Let's start with growth because we've already talked about the discount rate. So how do you get growth? Paper four, you're gonna spend over half of paper four is your growth rates. E email me, how do I get the growth rate from my company? My answer to that is how would I know? Where do you go to look up future growth rates? You should just email me, Professor, where will I be in 10 years? It's like, how would I know? I have no clue. No one knows the future, right? So we don't know the future, but there's no place to look up a growth rate. So it's a forecast. All forecasts are subjective, but you've got to be rational. You have to have a basis for your forecast. You can't just pick a number out of thin air. So I always start, my base is always the US economy, which you're going to talk about in paper three, right? Paper three, we're going to talk about your expected return on stocks. So you start there. How fast can the economy grow? We've already talked about this, right? I gave you a chart to do that. You have that chart actually on Blackboard. back into it. So on Blackboard, under content, if you look in paper descriptions, I have here paper three and four supporting charts. I love these charts. So first of all, I, I show you that corporate earnings historically have grown a little slower than the US economy but there's certainly some relationship. They're much more volatile, but certainly some relationship there. Um, so I'm starting with the US economy, which historically has been a little high for corporate earnings growth. And so this chart might be in your paper three. Why not in paper four? It might be in both, but in paper three, you've got to come up with your market risk premium, which is going to look at what you expect stocks to make. So that's part of this equation. In paper three, you're focused on the entire stock market. In paper four, you're focused on your company. So, but your company eventually is probably going to have to grow somewhere around the economy. So Google, Google can't grow at 20% forever and ever and ever because in about 30, 40 years, they are the economy. If you're growing at 20%, everything else is growing at 5%. You can't, you can't do it. I remember watching a, a commercial. Oh, I was going to show you these spreads. I'll show them to you here in a second. I was watching a commercial, uh, it was this stock trading and this guy said, I make 8% a week without risk. And I said, wow, I better get to know this guy because if he invests a thousand dollars, he's gonna make 8% a week in about 10 years, what will he be worth? That's what he's going to be worth in about 10 years. That's a really good return, isn't it? So the world economy is what? That's thousands, millions, billions, trillions. There's the world economy. And that's what he's going to be worth. What's the chance he sees making 8% a week without risk? Zero. He's not. So he's lying. And he's lying on TV in a commercial. I think that's the same commercial. It said if you have a fifth grade education, you can trade like, trade like the Wall Street professionals do. I don't believe that either. But anyway, he was real excited. So, but anyway, he's going to be a really important person here in a few years because he's going to own every single asset in the world. Same thing with Google. Google cannot grow 20% a year if the economy is growing 5% a year, especially given how big they are already. It's just not mathematically possible, but they can grow 20% for the next three years, next five years, maybe next seven or eight years, 10 years, you're starting to push up there a little bit. All right, let me show you something real quick before I do that. I meant to show you all this. These are historical spreads. And what kind of spread is it? Anybody remember this? What is OAS? Boy, if y'all interview with Victory Capital, you should put OAS in there. Do you remember? Was it option adjusted spread? Option adjusted spread, exactly. So what are they doing? They're taking out prepayment, those type of risk, and they're adjusting it. So any kind of option premium, they're taking it out. So if you look at this, Obviously, the high high yield bonds, they blew up in 2008. I actually loaded up on high yield bonds at the end of 2008, mainly because uh, a good friend of mine was running the high yield bond fund. And he says, I'm buying bonds that are yielding higher than their stocks are expected to return. So 
these bonds are like better than buying the stock because if the stock doesn't perform, at least, I mean, with the bond, at least I get something back. Um, and you can see coming down out of that, and you have the Tokyo earthquake coming back. Um, so those are spreads. But if you look at it over time, here's triple A spreads. What is that? Averaging about 25 basis points. Does, does that sound like enough? What did we just see on the other chart? 25 basis points. Anybody remember the other chart? Over 10 years, what do you lose? 70, 70, 70 divided by 10, seven, cut that in half for recoveries. So you need about three and a half basis points. How many are you getting? 25. It sounds like you're getting compensated. Do y'all see any downgrade risk here? This is kind of what we call price risk, right? You would have lost money in this year, even though the AAA, because the spreads would have gapped out so much. In 2008, you wanted treasuries. You did not want these. Here's double A, double A average, about 68 basis points. You saw triple A and double A were both 0.7%, and yet you're getting an extra 40 basis points. So would you ever buy triple A? Why not just buy double A, get an extra 40 basis points? You're still well covered for your risk. Here's single A. Anybody remember the loss on single A? 1.2%, right? So you need about 12 basis points. You're getting 111 basis points. Sounds pretty good. Y'all bring this up in an interview. Boy, that'd be like, what? Where are you getting these numbers? Triple B. I think there we saw, what was it? Uh, boy, I can't remember that one. 3%, right? So you need about 30 basis points. And they're yielding 174 basis points. And high yield, there you're getting 454 basis points. Multiply that by 10 and have to have about 40% of them go under under 10 years for this not to be paying you for your risk. Where are we currently though? We're below average, right? So what does that tell you for high yield? Is this a good time to buy high yield or a dangerous time? <laughs> be a dangerous time, right? You're not getting as much spread as we've gotten historically by quite a bit. 375 versus 40, you're almost 75 basis points off. And why is that? Because people are desperate for it, put their money somewhere because everything's so expensive right now. But anyway, this is another good chart. I'm, I think I'm gonna show this at um, Investment Society Wednesday night because it's it's a good way to, good data to have in the back, back of your mind. If I was doing bonds, I would have that 70, 120, 350, whatever, I would have those numbers in my mind and I would know what the current spreads are and I would be like, hey man, um, they're paying more than their risk, but right now they're an unusually low level. You know, just knowing where you are relative to history is a really great thing to do. Okay, all right, so we need to get growth, growth of the world, sorry, jump back to stocks. We saw this chart. So the US economy is probably anywhere from four to 7%, five to 7% would probably be a pretty decent number going forward. I know the last GDP number was really horrible. Um, much lower than expected, but um, the last employment report came out pretty strong, right? Y'all see that. Um, so, you know, it's been bouncing around here. People are a little bit unsure where we're going next because you got the inflation side, you got disruptions to supply and all that kind of stuff going on. So this chart might be in your paper three, but then this number is probably going to influence you on that terminal growth of your company. All companies are eventually going to be tied to the economy, even the ones growing really fast today, because you just you can't keep that growth going forever. So you start with the U.S. economy. So I think the U.S. economy grows somewhere in the four, the six, seven percent, seven if you're really optimistic, because productivity has been about two percent a decade. Employment, labor growth has been really weak, and it's expected to be weak because of all these baby boomers retiring. Inflation, two to two and a half percent. Who knows? Uh, be careful on papers three and four. That you don't have a lot of short term discussions. The fact that inflation is really high right now is really not that important. You're for forecasting for inflation over the next 50 to 100 years. Today is just a little bit of noise in the long term trend. So, what is the long term that you expect there? So, we're starting something in the four, let's just say four to six percent range. And you got to think about the industry that your stock is in. Are you in an industry that's growing faster or growing more slowly than the other industries? So you've had it, should have had Porter by now. Is that true? Y'all have seen Porter? Michael Porter, how many y'all know Porter? Five forces, anybody can name their five forces? You've had to have had this somewhere. 
can imagine you wouldn't have. Yeah. Buyer power, does that sound familiar? <clears throat> Supplier power, any of that sound familiar? The barriers to entry does. Barrier to entries, robbery within the industry, substitutes and threats, those are the five. I would know porters if you're interviewing with jobs because a porter is dominant in finance. Um, I don't know if I recommend Michael Porter's books unless you really have time to sit and focus on them. I was listening to his books riding a bike. You can't listen to his books riding a bike. He goes, it's really, really good stuff, but he goes into deep, deep, deep analysis, industry by industry by industry. That's why his books are so thick. He doesn't just give you the theory. He takes it really, really deep into the theory. So it's really good stuff, but it can be tedious to get through it all because there's so much details. But what is he asking? He's asking, what's a good industry? What's a bad industry? A good industry is one that has control over its buyers. Its buyers don't dictate the price. It has control over its suppliers. Its suppliers don't have control over them. Um, there's a lot of barriers to entry. So maybe there's a lot of property patent equipment or manufacturing sites or just intellectual property or patents. Uh, there's no substitution threats in you know, some new industry like you know, Valero, you're worried about electric cars coming along. That's going to be pretty disruptive. You don't want that kind of substitution threat. And then you don't want a lot of rivalry within the industry where people are fighting for market share. So you want a firm, you want an industry where all the players are very differentiated. You can tell one versus the other. So that's what Porter is saying. So good industry is one, has weak buyer power, weak supplier power, barriers to entry, no significant threats of substitutes. And there's not a lot of rivalry within the industry because what does rivalry in the industry means they're fighting for market share. How do you do that? You cut your margins, you cut your prices, cut your margins. You just fight for market share and whoever the last person standing wins that game. I like economic moats better. Industries and companies that have a sustainable competitive advantage, something that protects them from competition, but there's a lot of overlap between Porter and economic moats. So that's one way to think about your industry and your company. Does this industry have protection from competition? Does my company have protection from competition? If your company does, then you can have a much higher growth rate than the economy. All right, so I haven't figured out the Zoom versus Microsoft versus, I forget who the other one is. Doesn't Microsoft own Skype? And why did Microsoft dump Skype and go with whatever they're doing now? I can't keep track of all this stuff. Can y'all keep track? Is it obvious? Why do you use Zoom versus Microsoft? What's your decision there? Is it the person setting it up? Is it your account and how much it costs you? You get free Zoom, right, with a UTSA account. That goes away when you graduate. Is that the only reason you're using Zoom? Because it's free as a student? You know, those are the kind of things. I'm trying to figure out what's the event. I'm kind of shocked that Zoom zoomed like they did. I would have thought to Skype, I've been using Skype forever. My Spanish teacher in Peru, she uses Skype. I don't know why I use Skype. Zoom would have worked just as well, but I don't know why we switched to Zoom. Why, why did Zoom suddenly became the, become the place? Those are kind of the questions I ask. Why, why are you picking Netflix over Hulu and Disney? Is it the programs they have? Is it the cost? They're pretty expensive, right? I don't know why your parents, when I go home Thanksgiving, your parents probably buy cable still, don't they? Who buys cable? Does that make any sense to you? You probably have grandparents with land, with landlines, don't you? Yes. You all have, does it make any sense at all? Do you sometimes like, you know, stop because you have this cord on this phone? It's like, wait, what is this? It's plugged into the wall. But yeah, so it's like, I don't understand why anyone buys, um, especially if ESPM starts offering its services off of cable, so why would you ever buy cable? Sports is the only reason I'd buy cable and I, I can watch Law and Order 24-7, <laughs> no problems. So that's the only other thing I would like cable for. Um, so those kind of things you're asking is why, what does Netflix have that no one else has? If it's production, what's the problem with production? It costs them billions of dollars. It's just, it's a, that's an expensive economic mode, isn't it? If you gotta keep spending billions of dollars on new programming, so that's how you're thinking about your firm. Do they have something that, that is exciting to you? And is it something they can keep the competition at bay so they can continue to keep that going? Now you might pick a company for papers three and four that 
that these questions are easy to answer. That makes it easy for you to write your paper. So some firms like Microsoft are pretty tough because Microsoft does so many things. And you have to think about that every single business they do, Windows or their cloud computing or their gaming or whatever else they do. You'd have to think about each one of those. I saw a really cool company. Oh, what was the name of it? Well, this would be a great company for someone to do. I'd love to see those. And we found it in our uh, short list the other day. And it's easy to remember, it's ticker is cold, AmeriCold, real, it's a REIT. But man, what an incredible firm. I don't know how to get there. AmeriCold, let me get their website. Anybody ever heard of them? Those are sometimes the most exciting. You know, if you've got, let me just give you, let me give you a hint here on interviews. Uh, if you really want to distinguish yourself, they're going to ask you for an investment idea. And everybody does the Googles and the, and the Facebook, you know, go in with a company no one's ever heard of. And this would be a great one right here, Miracle. So it has these massive warehouses that store food, cold food before it goes to grocery stores. Pretty impressive firm, very, they do one thing that so makes the paper a lot easier to write. They, they're really good at it. Um, they're known for it. So what do you have? There's one really important economic moat. It's called switching costs. Have you heard of that before? You know, if you're a grocery store using AmeriCold, how is it? How easy it is to switch somebody else? That's not easy to do, is it? So switching costs gives you amazing competitive advantage. And if they're really good, I want to research it more. But if they're really, really good at what they do, and they're one of the biggest players, or maybe the biggest player, they say they're the biggest player. Uh, in something that's absolutely essential, right? This isn't going away. Y'all going to stop eating cold food? You know, it's pretty, pretty critical. Um, boy, this, this is the kind of firm I like, I like to own. This is kind of a Warren Buffett firm, isn't it? This is what you want. So, you know, that would be an exciting firm to write about. Um, so that's what you're asking for. What do they have that keeps the competitors at bay so they're not going to come in and take some of your market share. Because you all know, you learned this in economics class, a firm's making a lot of money. What's the whole rest of the world going to do? What are they doing? Let's copy them. Let's take advantage of them. All right? High returns attract attention unless you can keep them away. You all know what a moat is? Yeah. You know, around a castle, keeps the competition out or whatever the attackers out. It's very, very important. If you're going to assume a high growth rate, you've got to make the argument, how can this firm grow so fast without the competition destroying them? And then get down to the company level. The company level is where you start talking about market share. So there's markets that are growing really fast. Markets are growing fast. You can have a lot of fast growing companies in that market. But once the market itself stops growing fast, the only way the company is going to grow fast is if they steal market share from other companies. If you're going to steal market share from other companies, how, how are you going to get away with that? So I'm really impressed with Family Dollar and Dollar General. Those stores, they came in from nowhere. I don't like shopping at them. They come in from nowhere. And why doesn't Walmart just take them out? That's a pretty big threat to Walmart, isn't it? But what is Family Dollar and Dollar General doing? They're in neighborhoods. They're really small footprint kind of stuff. What is Walmart? Massive footprint. Um, Walmart said, well, we might try it. We may do some neighborhood stores. I've seen some of the neighborhood stores. They're not Dollar Generals. <laughs> They're like Dollar Generals times six. So, so it's, it's not something that Walmart really can do because it's just not their forte. So Dollar General, Family Dollar, these firms came in and they said, let's be quiet. Let's slowly come in. Let's not have a lot. We're not picking up massive amounts of business, but they did it in a really smart way. They picked up some market share from a really dangerous competitor. And they got away with it because Walmart really didn't want to mess with it. Um, so yeah, if you're going to pick up market share, you're going to have to do it in a way that you don't attract attention from the biggest players. I remember at USA, our CEO was like, we're going to increase our market share every single year. And he kept saying like this, he's in an industry that's not growing all that fast. I'm thinking if our market share is growing, from whom are we stealing business? And why aren't they doing anything about it? 
I mean, how often, how many businesses are losing to a competitor and they're like, oh, well, we lost some business, big deal, right? What are they going to do? They're going to fight hard to keep that business. So, you know, so always think about that. It's always much harder than we think it is. Just because someone has a good product and a good idea doesn't mean the business just takes over the world because everybody else is out there. I mean, like I said, I hope Amazon is out of business in 20 years because someone new comes along and completely wipes them out with something better. I just, I love competition, but it does make it difficult for the existing players. All right, questions on that. So you, this is the kind of thought process you're gonna do to come up with a growth rate. And you gotta put some thought into it. Your long-term growth rate will probably be really closely tied to the U.S. economy, but your short-term growth rate has a lot to do with what you think about your industry. This might be the number one thing that des decides which company you pick for paper three and four so that you can have a really good discussion there. Uh -huh. All right, so I have a question like, uh, about kind of the labor growth um, and how that factor into the actual like, growth bank. You see like how... U.S. and even more West Eastern countries in general are trying to get all below replacement rates. And then, like you said earlier, baby boomers are starting to yeah. retire. So there's not enough like, labor to really match. Like, how would you kind of talk about that and factor that into your... Yeah, in my, my opinion, there's a there's a, core, a negative correlation between productivity and labor growth. And if productivity really goes up, maybe it is to replace labor because we don't have enough labor. And it's also just because businesses don't like labor, right? Inflation goes up. So, you know, think about Japan. I think Japan's a perfect example. Japan has a horrible shortage of labor. So Japan is the, the leading in the world in what technology? Robotics, right? So we actually have technology in, in the past, back here, you had great productivity and labor growth, but in the past, Productivity made workers more valuable. So now, have y'all heard of Yang? He was running for president. Well, it was his thing. It, the world's changed. Now technology is what? doing, Not making workers more valuable. It's replacing workers. So your view on that, I don't, you know, I'm not a futurist, so I don't know. But your view on that, yeah, you might say, well, I might see a 3%, 4% productivity, but labor might actually be negative one. I might see, yeah, all these baby boomers retiring, the world's going to get around that by just not needing as many workers. Do you think uh, Amazon would love to replace all of the work, warehouse workers with with robots? Mm -hmm. would, they, would they jump at that opportunity? Yeah, but yeah. I mean, isn't that kind of like delays? There's no way you can have a company to replace everybody with robots right now. They would clearly do it. Yeah. So, I mean, there has to, like, there's going to be kind of like that lag time where they're kind of right. building up the technology and the capital to be able to actually replace the well, and then you have to have someone build the robots. So that may actually create more jobs than you're replacing because you got to build all the robots. Yeah, I mean, this is this is more economics. That's why I think economics is such a great course to take right now. But yeah, um, you're replacing labor with, with technology. You're, you're still, this is where I don't quite agree with Yang. You're still, technology is still making workers more valuable. So, but you also have, y'all remember in your economics class, you talked about the margin of product. Uh, productivity of labor. So if minimum wage keeps going up, the government may actually push that technology factor. If you have a worker that's worth $16 an hour and the law requires you to pay them 20, what's the firm going to do? That's the first worker they're going to replace with technology. Yeah. So if you force a company to pay a worker more than their marginal productivity, they're going to replace that worker. Um, so the government might actually push that even, even faster. So we'll, we'll see. Um, they're talking about, you know, 40, 50 percent of accounting and finance jobs being replaced by artificial intelligence and Python and all that. That's why I encourage students to learn coding. So at least you can be on the side that's replacing the workers instead of being the one being replaced. Who knows? You know, I think Yang's, you know, I, I agree with some of what he's saying as far as the risk, but I also think we usually get that wrong. Technology never moves as fast as they were thinking. Now we're talking about autonomous vehicles hitting in 2020. How many autonomous vehicles are you seeing driving around right now? It's just not happening, right? So I think it's gonna be slower than we think, but I, I do think government pushing wages up, firms are gonna move faster the more money they get out of it. You know, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, I don't know, HEB, Farah, how much, how much inventory does HEB do with robotics? 
Do you know? So. Did they do any? They have little machines going around at 2 a.m. So we have our uh, we have our robot system right now being built for like curbside specifically, and mm. I know in our warehouse systems, but in warehouse. other than that, I don't know. All right, I've seen some stores that are doing inventory with the robotics. Yeah. Just moving around. You know, that's pretty. I mean, how many of y'all done have y'all ever done inventory before? Yeah. It's a horrible thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's not fun. So I'd rather a robot do it than me anyway. But yeah, so so yeah, it's gonna be tough. You have to yeah, Blake, you have to think think about your finance your classes, think about your economics classes. And what does Dama Darren say? It's gotta all make sense. So you can't have 4% of productivity and 3% labor growth in the US. It's just not, there's just no way to get it. I could see 4% productivity if someone comes up with a way to power a car without any electricity or oil. Um, you know, that would be incredible. That's why I think autonomous vehicles could really, really jump up our productivity pretty fast. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I don't have, I, I don't, you know, if I disagree with your opinion, that's fine as long as you're logical. I don't count, I don't grade based on whether I agree with you or not. I grade based on whether you thought it through and what you came up with. If you're going to assume the US economy is going to grow 7, 8%, then I'm going to really want to see your argument for that. If you say 0%, then you're essentially saying, no, don't even bother buying stocks because it's it's going to be a disaster. So I'm not saying you have to be in the 4 to 6% range, but if you're outside of that range, you're getting into that unusual period or spot that you're gonna to have to really justify it. Now, one thing a lot of students do on the shorter term growth is this fixation on recent growth. And I can see that we, we have, you know, if they've been growing 15, 20% the last few years, that gives us something. <laughs> so at least say, well, you know, they've been growing that fast, they can continue growing that fast. So there is a tendency to do that. It doesn't work all that well, but it is the tendency to do that. So how do we come up with this short-term growth, right? So you got the long-term growth, that terminal growth that's gonna be tied to the economy. How do we get this short-term growth? So the first approach is to actually look at recent growth. And you can do this in Bloomberg if you'd like. You can do this with Capital IQ if you like. You all know how to use Capital IQ? So Capital IQ, you can bring in earnings for the last 20 years and you can come up with these growth rates. I'll show you what I did with Walmart. By the way, Walmart is a company you cannot do for your paper. You'll see why when I do the class example. Find it. Uh, it was recent when I did it. <clears throat> Well, that's not it. University of Washington. Well, I just showed this to my class the other night, so I don't know where it went. All right. Well, I use I use Walmart's uh, Bloomberg chart. So. Here I got some Walmart data. The things I like to look at with, with a company, what have they done the last three years, last five years, last 10 years? Now the last three years might be a little bit of an issue, right? What, what might be distorting the last three years? COVID. COVID. So maybe you do this before COVID and after COVID to kind of see as well, there's different things, I'll leave that up to you. But I like to do revenues, revenue growth. So how do you get a three-year growth rate? You take today and you divide it by what? There's one, two, three years. So what do I divide by the fourth year, right? If you can do three years of growth, you gotta start with the fourth year back. So that you have growth from here to here, that's one, growth from here to here, that's two, growth from here to here, that's three, all right? And how do you get a growth rate? Just like we did the compound annual, I mean, the compound return, remember compound average, you just raise it to one over three minus one. Does that formula look familiar? Very similar to what we did, right? So, 
Oh, come on, Bill Gates. So they've grown pretty strong here in the last few years in their revenue, 3.77. But what do we know about that number? COVID was a wonderful, wonderful thing for them. Let's look at their, uh, their net income. Their net income is up 5% the last few years. That sounds pretty strong. How do I do a five year? So I do five years today divided by what? Tell me when to stop. One, one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Y'all didn't say stop. Yeah. All right, this is like that um, the price is right game. Tell me when to stop. One, two, three, four, five, six. Stop. All right. And we raise it to the what? One over five minus one. So there's their. Your tenure growth rate, three percent. That seems like an awfully weak number, doesn't it? Inflation's been about two point two percent, but they've been adding all these stores. How can their revenue only grow three percent when they're adding all of these stores? And then we'll do the same thing with the tenure. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Raise to the one over ten minus one. So. You write your paper on Walmart and say, I think their short-term growth rate is going to be 17.3%. Is that possible? I don't know. How are they going to do that? Curbside? Maybe? Online? So I, my, I, I had a conversation with a student. You know, I'm kind of curious who's going to walmart.com to buy stuff now when Amazon's sitting there. And his argument was pretty good. He said, yeah, I went to Walmart because there's a Walmart right around the corner and they're going to deliver it. I'm going to have it. In a couple of hours, I can drive by and curbside. That's a huge advantage Walmart has that Amazon doesn't have. Can they really make that a business or is it simply going to cannibalize their current business? So you look at their earnings. How do you, why do you say their earnings growth? Even with COVID, their earnings growth has been horrible. And that's because of Amazon, right? Amazon's a major competitor. But also they have things like Best Buy and Home Depot and Lowe's. They have these other competitors. There's a lot of people out there. So the recent growth has been pretty strong. If you're going to rely on the recent growth and you got to say, we're going to have another COVID next year that's going to help them again. Can they have something else do that for them again? That's pretty unlikely, right? Is there possible we have a replication of 2020? Um, I think... After March of last year, I, don't, I think I ate at a restaurant once. <laughs> All my other food I bought, bought from HEB, not from Walmart. Uh, man, my HEB spending went up from like $250 a week to about $400 a week. And that's, that's a pretty massive increase for a business like that. What is HEB or Walmart going to do to make me do that again? Go to $550. You know, there's so much food I can eat in a week. Um, so... You know, so this recent is somewhat tainted because of what's going on. I don't know if there's anything else you would look in here. We do have their square feet. Their square feet has grown faster than their than their earnings have grown. And their square feet grew 1.33%. Their revenues grew 2.68. So they're they're only adding a little bit more than their square feet they're adding. So you know, it's it's not impressive. Last year is impressive. This is something where you might actually just look at COVID and just say, what did that do for them? That's a pretty good growth rate, right? In one year for them, 10% net income growth in one year. That's great for Walmart. If you look historically, they haven't done that. That's 10% in one year. How did that help their five year? They're hard to even notice. So it would be interesting to say, well, how did our earnings grow without that? Let's see, where are we going back to, to J? What if we take COVID out? What did I forget to do? Minus one. So going the last five years, their earnings are up 5.45%. But if you take 2020, 2021 out, the four years before that, their earnings had actually fallen, fallen 1% a year. Okay. 
And so COVID's a big deal. Would Zoom's numbers have similar issues? <laughs> You know, off the charts, right? It'd just be crazy, crazy stuff. So you can get this kind of data. If you don't don't know how to use Capital IQ, learn how to use it because Capital IQ is really being used a lot. You want to get it on your resumes. You want to go out there and test it. It's a little cumbersome to get your account to work just right because there's a little bit of a bug. Uh, the first few times I might kick you out, but once you get it, it's so easy. You just put your company in there. You click on income statement or something and you can just tell it to don't go back on time as far as you can. There's a little bar that goes back on time and just tell Cap IQ just to dump everything it has into Excel and you get many, many years of data and you can do these growth rates. You could do a bar chart or something that just shows whatever growth been. You might do two bar charts. You might do it with 2021 and without 2021 just to show, hey, yeah, their growth recently has been really strong, but that's that's entirely due to uh, this this global event going on. Uh, all right, so that's one approach. Look at recent growth, easy to get, and just see what's going on with this firm. Another thing you can do is what we call the peg ratio. And this is the easiest one. I think it's the most suspect one because it's not your assumption, it's the market's assumption. Your boss is not hiring you to tell what the market's assuming. The boss, your boss wants to know what you assume, but it will tell you at least what the market's assuming because there's something called a peg ratio. We're gonna talk about that a little bit more later, but a peg ratio is the firm's PE ratio divided by what analysts think the growth and earnings is gonna be. So PE divided by growth. So if we have the PE ratio and we have the peg ratio, we can get the growth by just taking the PE and dividing by the peg, and that will tell us what growth is expected to be. So the peg ratio is PE divided by growth. So expected growth is just your PE divided by your peg ratio. We'll get much more in, into that. So if you look at a Walmart, or let's look at a cold, why not? So you go into statistics and you use the forward PE, not the trailing, they don't have a forward PE, so we can't actually do the cold. Um, I don't know why they don't have a forward PE. Maybe probably because they don't have earnings, but um, so let's try, well, let's try a more interesting firm. Let's try Zoom. Zoom may not have earnings, so it may not work for Zoom, but okay. Is that Zoom? Did I get it right? Okay, so Zoom's peg ratio is what? Y'all write this down. 279, their forward PE is 54.35. Y'all remember that for me because I'm gonna forget it. So forward PE, what did we say that was? 54.35, is that a high PE ratio or a low PE ratio? Really high PE ratio, right? The stock market's about 25 to 30 right now. Their peg ratio was two something, right? 79. So expected growth plus that divided by that. Now, what is that? Is that a 1900%? No, it's actually 19%. Now, could Zoom grow 19% the next five years, given what they did last year when you have Microsoft? Freedom? Who's the other one beside Microsoft? Someone else is in there. Is yeah, Apple got a one that was out way before them that's very similar to Zoom? What was it called? I, I can't think of it. There's a third one out there. I don't know if Apple's got a product. I accidentally used FaceTime the other day. I don't know what button I pushed. Um, but, you know, it's what does Zoom have that's going to protect it from competition? If you can't tell the difference between them, you know, why would they grow 19%? And we're talking about 2020, which is like Zoom's best case story, and the market's saying they're going to still keep growing 19%. Where are they going to get these people from? Where's all this coming from? Well, it's, we'll probably use Zoom at Thanksgiving and Zoom my brother and sister-in-law in. That's kind of a cool thing to do, right? It's kind of fun to do. 
but we're not going to be zooming every single day of the week. Um, so, you know, how do you get this? Yeah, but you're going from 100% not at work to now two days a week, three days a week. Where's that 19% growth going to come from? Somehow they, they won the game of a lot of companies just suddenly signed up for Zoom. And I, some students were explaining to me why that was the case. And I can kind of see, yeah, I can kind of see that. But if you were Zoom, would you be worried about Microsoft? That's a pretty good competitor, isn't it? With a lot of really good scientists working. And if they say, well, they pick Zoom over us because of these things, what protection does Zoom have with patents and those kind of things? And what can Microsoft think of that's even better? Who knows? I mean, that's the kind of thing you're thinking about. 19% sounds like a pretty aggressive growth rate for a firm that just saw massive growth all in one year. But that's what the market's assuming. You don't have to use this number, but at least tells you what the number is. Now, is this 19% on average in the next five years? Does it start at 19% and come down? Does it start at 25% and come down to 18% or 15% and average is 19? Who knows what that number is? That's the number somehow that's plugged into that peg ratio. But that's an easy one, right? Students love that one because you just pick up two numbers and now you got a number. The question is, do you believe it or not? So if you're interviewing for a job, let me get another trick. I can give you tricks that will get you jobs so fast. So here's one thing you always say with stocks. So they're going to ask you, give me a good idea. So let's say you picked a marigold, cold. Um, so there's two phrases you got to bring up. So one thing portfolio managers love to hear is, I see something I think the market's getting wrong. Portfolio managers love that. I don't think the market understands this company. So I had a student, a former student speak, uh, one of the guys I used to work with at USA, he spoke to my security analysis class and I said, give me an example of one of your, one of your ideas right now. And he says, Apple. Okay, what's your idea on Apple? And he says, the entire world is assuming Apple's margins are going to shrink. And I think they're wrong. And here's why he had a really good argument for why Apple's margins were not going to shrink. Okay, that's exciting interview. I don't think the market understands this company. And here's the reasons why. That's pretty exciting. Now, the second thing you got to do is the word catalyst. What is the catalyst so the market figures out what you know? So if you know something and the market's wrong, but it's going to take a market 20 years to figure it out, that's not a good investment idea. Now, what's the advantage Jason had on his idea about Apple? Well, they're going to figure that out pretty fast, right? You only need a couple more quarters of earnings and they're going to see Apple's margins are not shrinking. He was exactly right. Apple's margin. And he talked about what was going on with Samsung and why he thought the market was getting Apple wrong. And exactly what he said happened, and he made a fortune on, on Apple. But you need those two things. I think the market's wrong on this, and the market's going to figure it out in the next six, nine months because of quarterly earnings or whatever, some announcement from the, the feds on approving some pill or something, whatever it is that you see. Why does that get people excited? Well, because why are you investing in stocks? Because you think they're mispriced. Why is the stock mispriced? Because the market's making a mistake. If you know the market's making a mistake and you can articulate it and talk about what the market is going to see that's going to bring them around to your side, you have an incredibly strong investment thesis. All right. So that's the way they ask that question. That's the kind of answer they're looking for. And you don't even have to believe it. You just got to have a good story, right? So go find a stock you can talk about like that and give a good story and then, you know, just sell it. Sell it as much, best you can. Um, so here's one where the market's telling you what they think. And I go on Zoom, it's kind of my story of Tesla. It's like the market's saying Tesla's going to essentially have 100% of the auto industry. And I just don't think Tesla's going to be 100% of the auto industry. There's some really good competitors. There's some new companies coming in in China. There's some existing companies like Volkswagen and others that are doing a good job as well. I don't think Tesla does have a superior car, but that doesn't mean the others don't catch up with them or have cheaper models or whatever. So if the market's assuming they become the entire market, I think that's a mistake. Yeah, uh, you know, Kathy Wood, our, our investor. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, she just, like yesterday or something, she was saying that 
she doesn't think any company will ever be able to catch up with Tesla. But even if they don't catch up, will Tesla be 100% of the market? So, you know, it's just going to be, I think it's pretty tough. I've never driven a Tesla. My students keep saying, go buy one. You know, you're retired, you got all this money. I was like, yeah, but a 50 year old man driving, you know, it's just, Look at that midlife crisis. I, don't want to do <laughs> I like my little Prius, and people say, "Yeah, they don't even notice me." So that's that's the goal. All right. The third approach is the textbook approach, which can work. I have to show you the adjustment you're going to have to make to get this to work. But it's what we call sustainable growth model. It's just a formula. Again, it's a formula. If you stick numbers in a formula, and you got the number. So sustainable growth says a firm can grow at its return on equity times its retention. So you should have gotten this in a previous class. So if the return on equity is 10% and they retain 100%, they don't pay any dividends, then they can grow 10%. If the return on equity is 10% and they retain 40% and they pay out 60%, then they can grow at 4%. It's that simple. The only adjustment I'm gonna say here is don't use return on equity, use normalized return on equity. What does that mean? You look at the return on equity the last few years, and if you see that the current ones is really unusual, maybe it's really low because of COVID, or maybe it's really high because of COVID, you try to find what's their normal ROE. Okay. The retention, I'll show you where you can get those numbers, but let's just look back at Walmart. So here's Walmart's return on equities the last several years. Their last return on equity is really not all that uh, extravagant, 12.7. They've been getting, you know, 10, you know, the average the last few years is 11.8. So you just look at the last few years and just see, you can get that out of a capital IQ, right? And just, just look, just make sure, you know, this is a firm whose ROE has been 10 to 11% and suddenly it's 32%. They're not gonna keep, at 32% ROE, so you got to somehow have to normalize it, all right? How do I normalize? I prefer, you could easily just say, well, let me just look at the average the last five years. That's fine with the Walmart, but if you got a firm that was 12%, 10%, 32%, negative 14%, I prefer the median. What does the median do for you? Gets rid of what? Assuming you can spell median gets rid of outliers, right? Average doesn't. The average is affected by outliers, the median's not. So if you're not sure about your firm, it's just really, really lumpy, then just take the median last five years and say, okay, here's our normal ROE. And you take all the noise out from COVID and everything else, here's a normalized. So normalizing the number is pretty simple. Just, just look at a little bit of history and see what's going on. Now, if the ROE was 8%, 9%, 11%, 13%, 16%, if you're seeing them just going up and you have the decision to make, you know, this is a firm that's just doing the right things. Can they sustain that? I mean, it's, there is no right answer. There's a lot of wrong answers, but there's no right answer. So, you know, if we look at Walmart or Zoom, we could even look at Zoom. I don't think Zoom's going to work here. So here you look at statistics. So we're looking for return on equity. I can find it under when they kept keep moving this, here it is. Their return on equity, write this down, 34%. I think this can be really easy because I don't think they pay dividends. If they don't pay dividends, what's their retention rate? 100%, so what's their growth rate? 34%, let's see, how do we tell? So here's their payout ratio. How do you get from the payout ratio to the retention ratio? 100 minus your payout is your retention. So what's their retention? 100%, pretty simple. So the market was expecting 19% growth, but the ROEs are telling us 34, but then you could look at that historically. I bet they weren't making 34% return on equities three years ago. I bet they were losing money three years ago, but you could certainly figure that out. Let's see how long has it been that they've been making positive earnings. So they had negative earnings just a couple of years ago. So does this look like a 34% ROE? Does that look like a 34% ROE? Can you tell when COVID hit? So that 34 would not be their normalized ROE. That was just one massive, incredible year. Right. So those are the three approaches I give you. 
ultimately it's, it's your opinion. There's one other one I can give you that um, if you have a Bloomberg account, Bloomberg does have, I think it's EEG, but Bloomberg does have an estimated earnings function that you can actually go on Bloomberg and see what Bloomberg is saying. I'm not so sure that's going to be radically different than the peg ratio because it should be all the same people, but you can look on Bloomberg and see what Bloomberg is expecting growth to be. The question is growth in what? We usually say it's growth in dividends because that's what we're valuing, but it could be growth in earnings. Um, could be growth in earnings per share. What we're assuming with our models is that those are all growing the exact same rate, but they may not be the case. And I'll show you when we get into the example, um, it's highly unlikely Walmart's dividend growth is reflecting what's going on with free cash flows. So you'll, you'll see that. So we need these growth rates. And then the question is, how long do you get? So if, you're, if Zoom is growing 19%, they're obviously not gonna do that forever. So now what you gotta figure out is, remember that terminal growth, that four to 6%? How long does it take them to get from 19% to four to 6% growth? Is that in three years? Is it in five years? Is it in 10 years? This is the hardest part of paper four. It also isn't that many points. I have students say, I think it's gonna take six years. Therefore, we'll talk about the H. The H is one half of that period. I think it's gonna take six years so my H is three. That's not telling me anything. I wanna know how did you get the six years? And that's where your creative writing comes in. You got to figure out something that you believe about this firm. Um, maybe it's Facebook and you're looking at how many countries they're saturated in, how many countries are they not saturated in, but they're growing. You know, can they get into India? Can they get more into the, in the South America? Those kind of things. You're trying to figure out when did they saturate so they just can't grow anymore other than just growing with population. All right. So what, what we're going to do Probably next class, although we're going to work, work those example problems. So it may take the next two classes. Is I'm going to write paper three and four in class doing Walmart. All right. It's not going to be a pretty paper, so I'm going to be going messy, but I'm going to do exactly what you need to do on papers three and four, but I'm going to do it for Walmart in class, which is why you can't pick Walmart as your company. All right. Any questions on that? So y'all work these problems. These are. These are actual problems off the exam. What I do on the exam is I pick a company and then the whole exam is about that company. So whether it's their bonds or their stocks or their return or their relative value or whatever, it's about that company. So this particular time I did Best Buy. So why did y'all get someone? So why do we have to do the holding period return? Someone off the top of your head without looking at your notes, what's what's that simple formula for holding period return? Yeah, so it's, yeah, just plug those numbers in. Where students make a mistake is they, they use the any market value in the wrong place or they divide by the wrong number. So, you know, just be careful. I have been known the the switch to order here. Here I go oldest to youngest. Here I go oldest to youngest, but it's possible I could switch. And for some students that just absolutely freaks them out. It's like, wait, that's not exactly how you did it, but that's, that's not finance, right? Okay, boss, anytime you give me stuff, make sure you do it exactly the same way. That's just not gonna work in finance. Look at what you have and assess it. All right, so someone else, give me, give me April. Just real quickly, just rattle them off real fast. 116.27. Keep going. 114.81. Well, plus, minus, times. Minus 114.81. Okay. Do you have accrued income here? What's, what's the only date you care about here? They announced in January, it went X in March, they paid in April. Is this April's, you only care about 
the X date. So what's the income here? Anthony, how much income is here? It's um, it's 114.81, sir. No, but the income. So that's the that's the beginning market value. What's the create income? So the X date's the only date you care about. The X date's March. We're doing April. So what's the income for April? Zero, right? And then Anthony wants the beginning market value. It's the 114.81, sir. All right. Who's going to do March? Someone different. We let's not run out of people. So just write it off real fast. 100, uh, minus 100, 100, 100. Zero. Is this one zero or not? When's the X date? It's March, and what are we doing? What do you add in here? No, here you're going to just add in the dividend. Oh, one zero seven. One zero seven. All right, so I gave you the hard one. <laughs> Divided by 400. All right. He's going to do the next one. All right, so they're paying a dividend of seven cents. And you, all you care about is the X date. These other two dates are completely useless. So you're, you're accruing the income. If you didn't accrue it, it'd be the payment date, right? We're not doing this on a cash basis. Why do we do the X date? Because the X date, just remember the X date means if you own the stock on the X date, you're getting the dividend, even if you sell the stock tomorrow. That dividend belongs to you. And so the stock price is going to fall by the dividend amount because you no longer get it as a stockholder. It's going to somebody else if you sell your stock. So the X date is the only thing we care about. So if you buy the stock the day after the X date, that stock's going to pay a dividend, but you're not going to get it. Someone else is going to get it. So you need them to somehow compensate you for that by reducing the stock price by that dividend. All right. So ignore the announcement date, ignore, ignore the payment date. Uh, all right, so who wants to do February? All right, Adrian, whoops. Wait, uh, or who, or Taylor, Adrian, who's doing it? Adrian, you do it, I heard you first. Where did it go? That'd be easier, okay, February. All right, y'all got it. What dollars did y'all get when y'all did that? I'm just going to key in the numbers. I mean, this is what you got. Can anybody confirm those numbers? 127, 1448 minus 778. What's January's return? If I asked you that, what would you say? Not enough information. You don't know that. What if I gave you January 1's price? Would that help? Well, the markets are closed January 1st. What if I gave you January 2nd price? Would that help? No, it has to be December 31st, so you can't do January. All right, and then we want to do the arithmetic. What's the arithmetic? It's just a simple average, right? <laughs> 0127 plus 0.1448 minus 0 0.0778. And what do we do with that? Divide by three. Or Bill Gates would do it how? Equal average. So there's your arithmetic average. We're going to annualize that. What do you do there? 
multiply by 12 because it's monthly. If it's weekly, we do 52, that times 12. Then you have an asterisk. What's your asterisk gonna say? Remember that asterisk? Why don't we just do, we just annualize three months returns. The CFA Institute says what? Does not allow annualizing periods less year. Is this a terrible violation? No, because if you go on the Bloomberg machines, they annualize it even if it's one, one week. So Bloomberg does it. They don't have the footnote, but I want you to have the footnote so you know. So you can't annualize um, returns if you only have three months. All right, then the geometric. This one's a little more work, right? You got to take one plus the first month, close parentheses, times one plus the second month, close parentheses, times one plus the third month. Raise it to the what? You probably want to put a parentheses around all of that and raise it to what power? One divided by n. One divided by three, so three months minus one. All right, y'all remember that formula? One thing we know is it's got to, it has to be less than what? If we did it right, it has to be less than what? It has to be less than 266. If it's not less than 266, we did that wrong. So let's see. I get, that looks like that could be right. Y'all get that? 2.25%. And then we can annualize the geometric. So we'll use the exact same formula. What I'd recommend on the exam is that you write this number down. So you just have it, and then you can raise it to the one third minus one, and then you can raise it to the what? How do you do this to annualize it? You don't raise it to the one third, you raise it to what? 12. 12 third, because it's monthly, right? If this was weekly, we'd raise it to the 52 third. This number can be higher than that number. So be careful there. The same footnote applies. All right, that's it. That's all you gotta do. Pretty simple question you just, if you put. What does it mean when it's not off? It's what? What does it mean when it's not off the, the arithmetic? Well, um, if you get really, really large, I mean, what the geometric is, is doing is it's, if you get a really good month, it's annualizing that, but it's compounding it monthly. And so if it's a big enough number and you compound it monthly, it can overtake, you know, especially if this number is really small, um, yeah, I, sh I should have done. So um, if, if this negative number is really small, that 14%, you're annualizing that. So you're essentially compounding that 14%. Yeah, it, it can get huge. So yeah. But the monthly cannot be, it's just impossible because that negative number has a bigger impact than the positive number coming back and you're not compounding it, you only have three months there. So, all right. So what I think we should do is on Tuesday, y'all just tell me the answer to the second question. All right, rather than working it in here, that would make a lot more sense. All right, on this question, I gave you two of these. We'll do the same thing, just get some practice here. So the first thing you wanna do is to get the KD. What is the KD equal? Risk-free plus the spread. What's the risk-free rate? So we've got, um, boy, I don't remember who FL is, but um, it's a 20-year bond issued 18 years ago. So what kind of bond is it? Two-year bond. Everything's two years. It was rated triple B minus today, but it used to be rated A plus when it's issued. Which of those do we care about? Only the triple B minus. We just care about today. 
All right, so that makes it pretty simple. Our, our discount rate is going to be a risk free rate, which is 0.0032 plus 185 divided by 10,000. Now, be careful. I just assume all college students can handle percents, but I've learned that's not the case. I have students where the interest rate's 3.2% and they enter 3.2 in their calculator. That's 320%. You're going to get a really crazy answer if you enter 320%. Some students on 0.32%, they'll enter 0.32. But what is 0.32? It's 32%. Is there a difference between 32% and 0.32%? A pretty big difference, right? So, Amazing. It's not just undergraduate students, but graduate students don't know how to convert to percents. And, and so I just assume everybody knows that, but make sure you're comfortable with that. 0.3% is 0 0.0032. We convert basis points into decimals by adding, by dividing by 10,000. So that's going to give us what, 0 0.0217 or something or 207. What would y'all get? 2.17%. Yeah. 0 0.0217. I'd recommend on exam, you don't use percents, you do everything in decimals. So if it's 5%, don't even look at the 5%, just, just type 0 0.05. If it's 1.5%, type 0 0.015. All right. So what is our, our cash flow? Our coupon is 7%. And it's the time, it's two years. So we need to convert this KD to an effective yield. Anybody remember how to do that? So the bond pays twice a year. We're just assuming that. I actually don't even tell you that in here. I noticed on the FAC exam, they use a bond that pays once a year. That's just so bizarre to me. Just in your mind, just think bonds pay twice a year. That's just, that's just a norm. Um, so the effective yield is going to adjust for that twice a year. Anybody, anybody remember it? Top of your head. Yeah, minus one. Yeah, perfect. So for our purposes, it'll always be two and always be two. If this was a CD that pays monthly, that it'd be 12 and 12. That number is always going to be the same. We're essentially just compounding it for twice a year. So that gives us everything we need. So if we put that into Excel. And what do we do? Well, let's let's start off with the guess. You don't have to do the guess, but we do the guess. So minus duration times the change yield for our two-year bond, I think I assume a duration of like 1.9, especially as low as interest rates are here. So I'm going to say minus 1.9 times, how did yields change? Well, the bond is currently paying 0 0.0217, but when it was issued, it was 7%. So that gives you, that gives you the guess. So minus 1.9 times 0 0.0217 minus 0 0.07. That tells us we expect this bond to be up 9%. If you do $1,000 times one plus that, that's our starting guess. We think it's going to be 1,091.77. Uh -huh. Well, that's just a definition of basis points. A basis point equals one over 10,000. So 100 basis points equals 100 divided by 10,000 are 0 0.01. It's just a definition of a basis point. All right, that's our guess. Let's do the Bill Gates. So what does Bill Gates say? Minus PV, what's my rate? 0 0.0217 divided by two, right? You gotta let Bill Gates know it pays twice a year. How many periods do we have? It's two years, but how many periods? Four from his standpoint, right? What's our payment? K 
coupon 7%, but you're not going to make $70 a year, are you? What are you going to get? 35 twice a year. And then what's my future value? What do you get back at the end? $1,000. Does that look right? Does Bill Gates know what he's doing? Do you think Bill Gates could do this off the top of his head without using, he probably remembers this stuff. And you got the sweet approach. You don't have to do this approach, but the sweet approach says, take the $35 and give it to me for all of eternity. That's the value of that coupon forever and ever and ever, but we don't get the coupon forever and ever and ever, but we do get an extra thousand dollars. So I'm going to add a thousand dollars minus that coupon forever and ever and ever. So in two years, I get the thousand dollars, but I lose all of that stuff. So I just got to take that to the present 1.01 plus 0 0.0217 divided by two raised to the four. All right, yeah, I think I got it right. I'm right about 80% of the time on this. Yeah. There's probably some typo in there. Okay. I'll be home soon. I love you. Right. Someone's hopefully they're not getting a call from their doctor or something. What do you think? How much money would you put down that this is right? Would you bet a thousand bucks? You would? Carlos would? Ah, you'd be wrong. Uh oh. Good thing you didn't do that. What'd I do wrong? There was something in here that I did wrong. Is it the two, 0 0.021 on the first Ah, one? right there. Yep. So I missed it by one little letter, but why do I like this formula? You don't have to do either any of these on the exam, but why do I like that formula? Because that's, that's what your PVIFA is doing, except for one thing. What's it not doing? The $1,000, right? But if you take, if you take the $1,000 out, and the $35 out. Oh, that still doesn't look right anyway. But if, if you do it correctly, you'll get, yeah, I guess that is correct. You'll get the PVIF, PVIFA function. So, so anyway, it's just that formula, but you have to do the $1,000 and the $35, all that. All right, let me see if I can figure out who's, uh, Someone on Zoom is is on speaker, so if, so if you can mute, huh? All right, um, I can't get in there without stopping sharing. So okay, Alvaro, okay. All right, but if you do all of that and you're perfectly right, what score do you get? Well, you won't get zero because I give you points for getting the 2.17 right, but you've got to do everything else. you got to do this down here. I want to see you actually show me a bond. I'm just convinced there's, grad, there's undergraduate finance students that have no clue what they're doing, just plugging stuff into a calculator, and it's just not giving you the right answer. So we'll get a cash flow in at six months, a cash flow in a year, a cash flow in 18 months, and a cash flow in two years. We'll get $35. And at the end, we'll get 1,035. Our discount factor is one divided by one plus our discount rate. Where did it go? What happened to our discount rate? Oh, we didn't calculate it yet, have we? So our effective yield is one plus 0 0.0217 divided by two. Oh, sorry. That's the downside of being on Zoom. All right. One plus zero two one seven divided by two raised to the second minus one. You know it's got to be a little bit higher. So plus one divided by one plus that raised to the time. Just kind of cash flow, just multiply across. 
All right, Carlos, you can get your thousand dollars back. What you, you willing to bet it to see if this is right? You think that's right? <laughs> yeah, it is. You should, you should have taken it that time. All right, and then we can do duration. You don't have to do this on the exam, but duration is really simple. You just take the time times the discounted cash flow divided by the sum of the discounted cash flows. You just copy that down. And so the actual duration. One point nine. What did I use? One point nine. So that was a pretty close. It's easy to kind of figure out duration for short term bonds. If rates are high, it might be one point eight. If rates are low, it might be one point nine. Much easier than say a ten year bond. A ten year bond could be seven or nine. It just depends. But, but the bond this short, we're pretty close. My estimate was pretty good, right? Ten ninety one seventy seven. That's a pretty good estimate. If I use the actual duration, it will still be off mainly because of convexity, but it gets me closer, a little bit closer, but, All right. So what's required for an exam, you know, show me this right there. You gotta do that. And then this, that's what's required. The duration is not required, but if you wanna show off, put that on your exam, that's never hurts. I would do it at the very, very end to make sure you have time. But, you know, those are the kind of things. I wonder what percentage of undergraduate finance students actually know how to calculate duration. I would bet it's less than 5%. We could see. Um, I doubt though, those that are interviewing with Victory, I doubt they're gonna ask you that question. <laughs> but you can maybe finagle them to ask you that question. <laughs> so, oh yeah, I know how to calculate duration. All right, so I'll let y'all do the other one. We'll just check the answer next week on the other one, all right? Y'all remind me though, because I'll completely forget to do that. All right, so there's a good chunk of the exam right there. Pretty straightforward. Should be a gimme. Most students do get those somewhat right. Students lose points here just for bad calculations, being sloppy. And then the biggest miss is on the geometric. Some students just completely forget how to do the geometric. Or they don't put the parentheses in the right place. Um, I can mess it up. What did what did Bill Gates do here? He raised it to one third power, but what did he raise it to one third power? It's just that very last parenthesis. So you have to make sure that you tell them, I want to raise the entire thing to the one third power, otherwise it'd be off. Carson. No, yeah, you have to do it by hand. Yeah. So but that PV function's on your calculator, isn't it? Oh, yeah. So you, you can do you can do that one. You can do this one on your calculator. Are any calculators from there? Yeah, because you just can't have anything in memory, but yeah. But if you get all this and you get the wrong answer, everything's set up and you get 1099.636. I'll probably give you 100% credit just because of a math error. However, if you get 987.23 and everything's right, I would count off for that. Why would I count off for that if I didn't count off for the other one? You know this bond has to be what? Greater than 1,000, right? Why? Because the coupon's 7% and the discount rate's too. So you can have a math error. You just you know type 72 cents instead of 27 cents, and I'll give you full credit. But if you do this one, that one I'll count off because you should have known it had to be greater than a thousand. So there are there are math errors I will I will count off on. Right. So why would you learn the duration formula? Because you want to be smarter than everybody else interviewing for jobs. So you know very few finance majors know that number. I would I would learn it if I were you. It's not very hard, is it? Y'all see how duration is just a weighted average of time using the the discounted cash flow just waits. It's just like the definition says. Let's look at the formula and see if you recognize the formula now that you've done that. I like Wikipedia. Where is Wikipedia? There it is on duration. So you should now recognize this formula. What is this formula telling you? So the present value of the cash flows going from one to n what is that that's the 1094 right the price we got 
in 94. Why is it a sum key? Because you're going to take, what are we, what's the only, just these two are exactly the same. What's the only difference about the numerator? What do we add into the numerator? Time, right? What are they doing? They're taking 0. 0.5 times its cash flow divided by the total, taking one times that divided by the total. You see, that's exactly what we did, didn't we? Which is more impressive, you, you write that down. So yeah, I know this. that's the formula, but that's exactly what we did. The sum key always makes things confusing because you got to do it multiple times. Excel makes that really easy because you just plug that in. Um, it's a little more difficult if you're doing convexity. I don't know if they show the formula for convexity. Why not? There's effective duration. That one is not a formula you can calculate. Because effective duration is a simulation you've got to actually calculate over and over again. I still not a big believer in spread duration, but it's interesting. There's convexity, find convexity, calculation of convexity. You see there's no formula there. Yeah, convexity formula, you can find it out there on the internet, but you'll find multiple versions of it. And it's it's a massive, massive formula. But anyway, so you know duration now, it's not that complicated of a concept at all. All right, y'all got it? There's two 100s on, on the exam, two problems, piece of cake. All right. So stock valuation. <clears throat> So last class, we're talking about the growth rate, and then the, we finish up with the timing of the growth rate. You have the near term and the long term. So the near term growth rate is probably the easiest because you're going to we're going to tie that somewhat to what you think the economy is going to grow at. That's pretty straightforward. Long term growth rate is, I mean, the short term growth rate is really tough. But I gave you three approaches to that: look at history, look at the peg ratio, look at sustainable growth. Um, but you can at least get a ballpark number of what you think might make some sense. Then the question is, how do you decide how long it takes to get from short term to long term? I'm using near term here. I don't know why I use near term instead of short term. Um, now, Demodaran, he says 10 years. So H is one half of that. When we see the H model, H is one half of that. So when you see 10 years, that means an H of five. So just remember on paper four, H of five is pretty aggressive if you have high, high, high growth. It's really, really difficult for firms to grow that fast. So, you know, we're talking last night in Investment Society about DoorDash. Could DoorDash grow 30, 40% the next several years? I bought my first DoorDash gift cards. Why didn't I buy Uber Eats this, this uh, gift cards? I don't know, which would you rather get? Do you have a preference? DoorDash. Why do you like DoorDash better? I mean, their website was much more impressive. Is it the same delivery people or are they different people? Is it like Uber where you get your Uber driver and they take down their uh, Lyft poster and put up their, or are they different people? Uh-huh. Favor. Favor, what do you mean? That's another one. Oh, I've never no, heard of them. One by AGD, so it's fine. Oh, is it favor or flavor? Favor. Oh, really? It's like they're doing you a favor? That's not, so then that means it's free. So that's even better. <laughs> so why do you want me to pay you? It's a favor. Um, it's like that cartoon, you know, that, sorry, just came to mind with this. The doctor comes in and says, hey, it was a miraculous recovery. And the patient says, great, that means I don't want to pay you. But, but anyway, so those are things you can say if you want to get out of the bill. Um, all right, so DoorDash, yeah, I mean, they're expanding overseas. They're doing a great job. Are they better than Uber or not? Those are the kind of things to try to figure out. I didn't understand the numbers last night. He said they have 20 million consumers and 1 million drivers. I say, well, I worded. Every one of their consumers ordered once a week. That'd be 20 deliveries a week. And I make five bucks a delivery. That's a hundred bucks a week. I don't think you can make much money as a deliverer if you're making a hundred dollars a week, but there must be something wrong in those numbers. I don't, I don't quite understand that. Y'all know DoorDash drivers? Yes. And so like their peak hours are at like 11 to 2 a.m. And they just start picking people. Are How much do they make for delivery? Some of the guys say they can make about 30 bucks an hour if they're... 30 bucks an hour. Right. But, but if they're only doing 20 deliveries a week, that's not going to work. So there must yeah. be more deliveries than that. And that's the other problem with businesses like this is you'd like to be to work eight hours a day. 
but if you're doing everything but you know two hours in a day it, it, it's that kind of asset turnover thing but anyway there are firms out there i think doordash is good uh i've never used doordash but i can see the advantage of it i can certainly see you know remember what is a great firm a great firm takes a problem a consumer is having and solves it either a frustration or some kind of you know kind of uh i forget the word but you know kind of they want to stand out you know tiffany's or whatever uh, so it is a, a problem or some kind of status that they want. Um, well, what's the problem DoorDash is fixing? You don't have to drive all the way somewhere to buy something. You're willing to spend an extra five bucks to get it. Yeah, it's it makes sense. <laughs> so, I mean, our time's valuable to us. So you'd have to decide. So how would you figure that out? Well, they got 20 million consumers and there's 350 million people in the U.S. and 400 million in Europe and a billion in India and a billion in China and a billion in Africa. Where are they gonna expand? Who's competing with them? How are they gonna do? What could that 20 million ultimately be? So you saw Facebook go from what? A few Stanford students to now three, three billion people around the world and they did that pretty fast. Could, could DoorDash have three billion consumers ordering from them? That's conceivable, right? 20 years from now, are you more likely to use Facebook or use DoorDash? Or will it be a drone flying the food to, food to you? And we use DoorDash to get the drone to fly to your house. You know, those are kind of, do you think we'll have drones in 20 years? Mm -hmm. You just order and just show up in your backyard. You, your dog doesn't get it or whatever. Yeah, there's been some tests of it. Um, I've also seen like in New York, they don't use drones. They actually have robots, rolling robots, and they, they take it and you get a code kind of thing. Uh -huh. Well, in Japan, the Yakuza, they're, uh, they're transporting drugs and drones. Hmm. And then the police are, are using <laughs> drones to tap <laughs> it. Yeah, eventually we'll all just sit at home and we'll have all these wars and police and all be uh, our, our robots versus your robots. We did in first interesting world war, you know, where it's whoever's robots wins, the rest of us like, okay, y'all win. Or probably be video games and we'll just have our video game players play theirs and whoever wins. But I mean, the world's going to change quite a bit. So, you know, I look at DoorDash, you know, the drones is interesting, the autonomous vehicles is interesting because the biggest cost that they have is those delivery people. They'd sure love to get rid of those people, I'm sure. They probably won't tell those people that, but they sure love to get rid of them. So you got those kind of decisions, but it, it's not easy. You've got to come up with something. What I'm looking for is a good rational thought process to put something down. You'll probably get full credit. But if you say, I picked eight years because I thought it was eight years, that's not a very good explanation. Okay. Make up something, be a creative writer. So those are all your assumptions. So let me just real quickly walk you through the process. We've seen this before. So for paper three, you've got to get a discount rate. And when you do papers three and four, I just want one paper. I'm calling it three and four because they're worth twice as much as paper two. Um, but you've got to come up with a discount rate. The discount rate, we're going to use capital asset pricing model. You don't need to give me a discussion of CAPM. If you did that in your first job, I'm using CAPM and you explain it, your boss is going to be really insulted. <laughs> it's like, what? You don't think I know what CAPM is? So there are certain things we just use because they're so common. You can say using the capital asset pricing model, the discount rate is risk rate plus beta times the market risk premium. That's okay, but you don't need to explain William Sharp came up with it and all that's that's a little much. So we need a risk-free rate. So you have to handle the fact that the interest rate is so low. We've had some interesting week, haven't we? With uh, the inflation numbers coming out. So, um, okay, is that an ad? Thank you. So the 10 years back to 156, it looked like we're getting to two and then it dropped back down. It looked like we're going to one. Now it's kind of just hovering 156. That's still a very low, three months ago, that was a very low number. Today, when they're reporting 6% inflation, it's a really, really low number. I saw the investment side last night. If inflation is really 6%, the stock market is the most expensive it's almost ever been. If 
inflation is really 2%, it's kind of in the pack of expensive, but if the inflation is really 6%, this stock market is materially overpriced. So, but the bond market doesn't seem to think inflation is a problem. If you thought inflation was going to take off to 2, 3%, 3, 4%, would you be buying a 10 year bond at 156? That doesn't seem to make much sense. So, you've got to address that. So, you, I gave you a few ways you can address that. Um, I, I don't like this and the normal real rate plus expected inflation. I wouldn't use that anymore because it gives you just too high of a number. So I've kind of, I've thrown out that approach. So that was my previous approach. I still have a bunch of students that do this on the paper. I'm not sure why um, I, I wouldn't do this. I mean, if you come out with a three and a half percent risk-free rate, they're going to look at you funny. So how in the world do you get three and a half percent? Oh, I'll just normalize. It's like, we haven't been at three and a half percent for like a decade. What are you, what are you doing? This doesn't make sense. So my approach is the five-year forward rate. I like that approach for two reasons. One, I do think we're in a really noisy COVID period right now. And so it kind of gets me beyond that. Let's get the noise. So I like that approach. The second reason I like it is I love for undergraduate students to know how to do the forward curve because it's really simple to do and it's a really powerful skill to have. Um, our Damodaran approach is just use that 156, but then you have to put some words with it. And he gives you the words, you can read his arguments for that. But he says, it is the risk-free rate. It is a number, don't normalize it. Uh, one of my students met him and asked the question, what about the forward rate? And his answer was, yeah, that's fine, but it's not much different. So I'm glad he thought it was fine. So I got his endorsement of my approach, but I disagree with him. That's not that different because it really is quite different. <laughs> It's, it's a good 60, 70 basis points higher. So, um, so I disagree on it not being that different. So that's the first three rate, usually about you know five, six paragraphs, maybe the first page. You could certainly put extra graphs in there if you wanted to show the 10 year treasury over time to show that we're at a really low period right now, that would be fine to do. Um, but you have that number. The market risk premium, we're going to use um, the implied approach. So the implied approach, we've already talked about that. You do that on exam one. You're going to figure out what we expect stocks to earn. That's going to be your required return on stocks. You'll subtract your risk-free rate and you have it. And you remember from exam one, the expected return on stocks is nominal GDP growth, which is productivity plus labor growth plus inflation. Here's Damodaran's risk, equity risk premium. There's his risk-free rate. There's his equity risk premium. You can see his equity risk premium stays fairly constant over time. Doesn't radically change. What's changing is the risk-free rate. You see the risk-free rate got really low. His, what he's adding on top of it's not radically different. But I gave you his site. He, he has his stuff out there for free. He just he puts, he publishes everything. He's, I don't know if New York Stern School is like, why are you giving away all your stuff for free? But you can access it. All right, so the, the implied approach, you don't have to explain all this, but it's pretty straightforward. For the market risk premium, we're trying to figure out the required return on stocks to compensate us for risk, but there's no place to go and get that number. The require, you can't go look up the required return on stocks but we have a pretty good chance of coming up with the expected return on stocks. It's that dividend yield plus expected earnings growth and expected earnings growth is gonna be tied to the economy. So you just put all that into your paper. If you want a more detailed discussion of that, that Barclays article I showed y'all, you could certainly reference that. I think I put that out on Blackboard, but if not, I'll, I'll put it out there. It's pretty ancient, but it is still pretty current. Um, so expect return on stocks. Uh, it's going to be the, the dividend yield, which I say 2%, but what is the dividend yield today? So how do you get the dividend yield today? Just go find the SPY in Yahoo Finance, because that is the S&P 500, and its current yield is only 1.3%. I'm going to talk a little bit about another adjustment you can make to that for stock buybacks, but that's a really, really historically very low yield, 1.3%. A really interesting chart to do is the dividend yield versus the earnings yield. Anybody know what the earnings yield is? 
Anytime you see that here the word year, yield, you're dividing by the current market price. So what would earnings yield be? If dividend yield is dividends divided by market price, what is earnings yield? Earnings divided market price. Well, what if you flip that, what would you have? If earnings yield is earnings over price, what's the converse of that? The price to earnings ratio, right? So what's the earnings yield in the S&P 500? They don't show you the PE ratio here, but you just get the PE ratio, which is about 25. So it's really interesting to actually gross to, gross to earnings yield over time, the dividend yield over time. If you see them separating, then it probably means that dividend yield is understating the true value of the stock market. And that companies, instead of paying dividends, they're buying their stock back. But that is a scary, scary, scary low number. All right, I'm gonna do this. Remember, I'm gonna do Walmart and do, go through all this. So I'll show you how to do it. Then beta, we already talked about that, right? Revenue sensitivity, operating leverage, financial leverage, and history. So you'll do all of those. And that'll give you your discount rate. You're going to use three models on your paper, the dividend discount model, the capitalized earnings model, and the H model. So the dividend discount model, You've probably you've seen that so many times, but dividend zero times one plus G divided by K minus G. Where do we get dividend zero? Let me just show you here. We can do Disney. So we go to Disney, we do historical data. We want dividends monthly. Let's go back a few years, just two max, max is fine. And apply, and dividend zero is just go back one year. And I'll be careful that you go back one year because if a company only pays dividends once a year, you only go back one year, right? Don't assume that's four quarters without looking at the dates. Here you can tell that's four quarters, right? Well, maybe it's not, is it? It's not, isn't it? How often do they pay dividends? They haven't paid dividends. Did I get Disney? Yeah. They show they haven't paid dividends since 2019. Maybe they stopped paying dividends because of COVID. So if you don't have any dividends, what do you do? Well, you have to email me and I'll have to give you free cash flow per share or you pick another company. All right, so they don't show dividends. Let's see what uh, Yahoo Finance shows them. What does Yahoo Finance show? NA, NA, doesn't have it. We do. The same thing with Walmart. Oh, I always do that. I hit enter before the system catches up. So with Walmart, pretty straightforward. That one is quarterly. There's August, 2020, August, 2021. So there you just add up those four dividends and you got it. 209 is their dividend, dividend zero. So you get dividend zero. So if your firm doesn't pay dividends, you'll have to email me and have to figure out a number. I'd recommend you pick a stock that does pay dividends. And then the KE, just did that in paper three, minus growth. Remember, really, really important, your growth must be lower than your K or you've got a you got an error somewhere. It's still, I it just, I think some students write papers and it's like they never step back and say, what did I just do? It's like, okay, write it, write it, write it. It's like, well, all right, you just gave me a stock valuation of negative $312. Says, yeah, that's my valuation. And it's much lower than the current price, so I'm recommending to buy. Does that make any sense at all? I mean, it's like, it's like you, you think this stock is worth negative $312? Um, or it's less than the current price, so I want to buy it. So you have a stock you're worth negative $312. Someone walks up to you and says, hey, I'll take that stock away from you for free. Would you hand it to them? Well, it's worth negative three hundred dollars. He'll take it for zero. So yeah, that's a good trade. Does that make any sense? Right? Someone's going through the motions with Alex. He's stopping and thinking about it. So how will you get a negative number? You get a negative number if your growth rate is greater than K. Does that mean the stock's worth negative? No, it means the stock's worth infinity. It's just this model can't account for infinity. So if your growth rate is greater than your discount rate, the stock is worth infinity. Do you want to have a stock on paper four that's worth infinity? So it's currently trading for 125 bucks. I think it's worth infinity. So I'm recommending a buy. What would your boss think of that? 
It's like, okay, you've been watching too much Toy Story or something. That doesn't make sense. All right, so this is essentially a perpetual growth annuity. Capitalized earnings is my model. We talked about that one where we're just trying to figure out the existing business. So instead of dividends, we use earnings. Instead of growth, we use inflation. We just want to know what is the existing business worth. So you have to come up with an inflation rate, but guess what you did in paper three? You came up with inflation rates. So you've got that number already there. No reason to switch it. Then the H model, we talked about that. It's the dividend discount model. And we add this one little section here in between, and that's where you get that gross short term. And then the H, if you think it's gonna be 10 years to get from short term to long term, then your H is half of that or five. All right, so there's everything you need for the paper. I do have what's called proprietary quantitative model. Um, I don't know if I actually wanna show you that or not. I might show you that later, but essentially what it is, is you just put everything in Excel and you figure it out. I built this specifically for firms that don't pay dividends. Um, and essentially it's the H model for firms that don't pay dividends. So it lets you grow earnings for, for several years. What the model says is tell me what your terminal growth is, that long-term growth. So I say that's 6%, but they're starting at 20%. And then you ask, how long do you get from 20 to six? So it sounds a lot like the H model, right? If you say 15 years and it takes 15 years to get from 20 to six, and what the model says, as soon as you get to six, you'll start paying dividends and then it values those dividends. So it's a really straightforward, easy model to use. And there's other models out there, free cash flow models, which is what the other professors want me to push. I just don't, I just don't like these models because they're, you have to get extra numbers. It doesn't use KE, they use WAC. And I don't wanna mess with WAC in this class. It's just too much extra work, so I don't wanna use them. You can do free cash flow, but don't use free cash flow to the firm, just do free cash flow to the equity. And then you can do it just like the dividend discount model or the H model. You just substitute free cash flow per share instead of dividends. And essentially what you're saying is dividends don't really reflect the free cash flow of the firm. You know, if you look at, at Walmart, their dividends are very predictable. They go up like a penny every year, probably not reflecting free cash flow. So let's use free cash flow instead of dividends because that's going to give you some more accurate number. Continued claim models, we're not going to definitely not going to use that. That's more graduate level. If you're interested in that, though, Dan Darren has a really good lecture on that. And he actually provides his model that you can use. But what this is saying, there's some firms that when you value the firm, you'll always get a value that's too low because these firms have these options. They have this thing, they can do something. If it doesn't work, they just shut it down and they lose a few million dollars. But if it works, it's worth billions of dollars. So it might be Disney with a new movie, the next Toy Story. That would be pretty huge, right? Or the next, I don't know, what is it, Marvel now is the thing? I, I haven't been to movie theater. Have y'all been to a movie theater in the last two years? Mm -hmm. What's the big movies now? Is it is it all Marvel? Venom, Spider-Man. I mean, when are we gonna get sick and tired of Marvel and Spider-Man? What else can they do? But anyway, so that's the big thing. In my lifetime, it was Jaws, and then we had you know five Jaws movies. Like, what else can you do? Um, but those things come out. Star Wars, whatever. Star Trek, they come out. You get as much money out as you can. Those those are huge. That's a Thing, it's things on the pharmaceutical, right? A pharmaceutical comes up with a new drug. It just takes over the world. So the downside is you lose a few million dollars. It just doesn't work out. The upside is billions. You can't value that in the traditional discounted cash flow. So what you do is you value the firm and then you take that optional thing and you value it separately using option pricing theory. And it's quite complex. It really is graduate level. And then we have these things. I don't know why anyone ever used these again, but multi-stage growth models. Um, I, yeah, if any professor ever requires you to learn this for exam, you need to tell them, they need to rethink their approach. There's no reason. I had one professor in graduate school, I made a mistake of telling him, he was counting out for the squirreliest things, like not using complete sentences on a finance exam. So I didn't say the net present value is, I just wrote and he counted off. I said, why'd you do that? He says, well, the grades are too high, so I had to count up for something. And so I made him a second say, well, just make your exams harder. And boy, that made him mad. 
And I knew I made him mad. And so he put this formula on the final exam without telling anyone. And I knew he's going to, so I knew it. And that probably made even matter because then I did really well in his exam. Um, I think I made a 92 and the class average was like a 50% because I knew he was going to do that. But he shouldn't have. Isn't this a stupid equation, equation to put on an exam for you to memorize? Why would you memorize that when you have Excel? But that's the multi-stage models. Um, I, there's got to be some professor out there still requiring their students to memorize that. And it says, why would you ever do that? All right, so what we're going to do, I'm going to do this in Excel. I'll be adding things as we go. I'm going to sense that you, I, I'm going to write your third, third and fourth paper real messy. So you'll have to fill in the words and the text, but I'm going to walk through it. I'm going to use Walmart. So you can't use Walmart. So what can you do? So let's look at the paper description. And I won't provide an example paper in this because the last time I did that, about a fourth of class just took that paper and edited. It's like, yeah, I don't want you to do that. I do have YouTubes where I've done it before. These are probably pretty accurate. I might've changed my opinion on some of this stuff, but uh, essentially what I'm doing now, I'm gonna, I did on these YouTubes as well. They're not, these aren't like one hour each. They're pretty fairly short. So paper three is your discount rate. Um, you got to discuss the risk rate, the market risk premium and your beta and follow that four step process on the beta, including the rolling beta chart. Um, there's videos that show you how to do the rolling beta. Just make sure whatever video you use that it's doing monthly, right? I switch from weekly to monthly, switch from three years to five years. So make sure you got the right one. I think these are the monthly ones. Put it all together and you've got your discount rate. And then for, for paper four, you can use the Gordon growth, capitalize earnings, H model. Got to do all your assumptions. So you need dividend zero, you need a short, I mean, a long-term growth rate. You already got your KE from the previous paper. You need EPS, you need inflation. You did that in the previous paper. You need the H, growth short-term, growth long-term. That's the hardest part, the growth long-term. You're probably tied back to paper three with your assumption on earnings growth for stocks. And you'll say whether your firm's above that or below that, but you can't be very far off. If you use 5% in paper three, your long-term growth of your firm will probably be in the four to 6% range. You're not gonna be radically off. And if you're saying, well, I have a company, I think they're gonna be out of business in 10 years. There's no reason to write the paper. Say, hey boss, I don't think this firm's gonna survive, but here's my valuation. It's like, why are you even, why are you wasting your time? Pretty obvious you don't want to buy a stock you think is going out of business. So, you know, so your long term growth is probably going to, you know, be three, four, five, six percent, something like that. Um, and then you'll have a final recommendation, and that's where students lose a lot of points just, just from organization. It's like it's just not well organized. So, make it really clear what you're talking about. What's the current price? What are you recommending? Um, all right, so that's what we're gonna do. So let's just start off with what do we need? So if I were you, I'd start with that. So I need a risk-free rate, I need a market risk premium, I need a beta. There's paper three for paper four, I need dividend zero, EPS zero, I need my KE, paper three, I need inflation, also probably from paper three. I need a long-term growth. It's tied to paper three. Doesn't have to be the same. So if you think economies or in stock earnings are gonna grow 5%, but you got a company that's pretty long in the tooth in their existence, you know, then you say, you know what, if I think the economy is going to grow 5% and corporate earnings grow 5%, this company, I think, is probably only going to grow 3.5%, 4%. They're already out there pretty saturated. You have short-term growth. You have the H. So that's everything, right? We leave anything out. It's 
So you're essentially writing a paper justifying these, and then you plug them into three models. Here you plug them into FM. And you summarize. All right. So in your previous classes, you might have done this, but it might have been multiple choice exams. So why do I do it like this? Well, it's back to one of my pet peeves is on the exams. We give you all of this and we ask you to plug things in the formulas. And I'm so glad that's not finance. I'm so glad finance is a lot harder than that. Or boy, would that have been a boring career. And they probably wouldn't have paid me as much as they were paying me uh, the plug numbers in the, in the formula. So why do I do it like this? This is what finance is. It's coming up with those assumptions. You will not have a professor giving you numbers in your job. In fact, you won't have a boss giving you numbers. In fact, you won't have a boss training you on getting the numbers. <laughs> it's, it's really, it's an amazing, I don't know how I survived my first finance job. It's like no training whatsoever. It's like, well, didn't you, you have a college degree, right? You figure it out. It's like, okay. And you just hope you're doing the right kind of thing. And to me, it's kind of scary, but it's also pretty exciting. Um, so you've got to figure out these assumptions. They need to be accurate at least to some reasonable level. They need to be rational. They need to be consistent and logical. Um, but two students doing the same company could come up with fairly radically different assumptions. All right, so let's start with the risk-free rate. So I'm going to make a few points addressing very low rates. I might put a chart that shows that. How would you do that? All right, it's 329. Let's see how long it takes me to do that chart. You type H15. There's historical data. There's historical data. Go to download. Download. I did the bond evaluation earlier with today's date. Like how you did it last class or well before. Oh, it's like a net present value kind of thing. Um, all right, so there's the 10 year. The only problem is for some reason, the Federal Reserve thinks we want to see holidays. I don't know why they think we want to see holidays. So you do have to sort the holidays out. And there's a lot of them. If you're curious where all the holidays happened in the last 70 years, there they are. February 12th, what is that? Okay. What? Is it Valentine's well, Day? Well, I don't think they, it's a federal holiday for Valentine's. Is that President's Day? That could be President's Day. So get rid of all those holidays and you have to resort it. So there's all your dates. Here's your chart. It's now 331. <laughs> Doesn't take very long, right? What if I'd done this when I was in college in 1982? How long would it have taken? Check back with me in what, about nine months? <laughs> I don't know how I would have done it. Crap, I would have done it by hand, right? And trace it or something. It would have been practically impossible. Probably what I would do is go find some textbook and I don't know. Yeah, I don't even know how we get it from the textbook. You probably get a camera and take a picture. I don't even know. I don't know how we did school back then. <laughs> it's, it just seems crazy, but. Yeah, so there's the 10 year. We're at a very low period right now. You might zoom out and just show that because it's still pretty low. Why is it so low right there? That's COVID, right? We dropped down to an all time historical low of 50 basis points. Rates have come back up and not much. So that might be a chart. I'm not saying you have to do that, but that may be a chart you might do. That would be interesting. I'm going to discuss. In my opinion, this is me. You have to write your own paper. The noise of, of COVID and desire to get beyond that. So what am I leading up to? I'm going to use the forward rate. 
So that's kind of my argument. I, I kind of say that all the time. It's like we're always in a noisy period. But yeah, I mean, that's kind of where we are in the last several years. So that's my approach. Your approach can be different. If you if you look up Damodera and read some of his articles, it might give you some other ideas. You could probably um, you could probably just Google it and just say historically historically low risk free rates and just see what comes up. There'll probably be an article from Yale or an article from Stanford, UT Austin. Who knows? There's probably professors writing about that all over the place. So you know you could probably find you know impress me. Do, do your own stuff. Uh, and then I'll do the forward curve. The forward rate, how do you do that? Well, if you watch my video, I think it's linked in the notes. Pretty straightforward. You take the 20 year, so it's one plus the 20 year, raised to the 20th, divided by one plus the 10 year, raised to the 10th. Take all of that, raise it by the one, divided by 20 minus 10 minus one. So that's the approach. I would rather use the 15 year and five year. The problem is it's really hard to find the 15 year treasury. You have to really hunt around because it's not on the yield curve. So let me just try that real quick. Where would I get all that? Well, just type treasury yield curve. There it is. The 20 year is 196. The 10 year is 156. So what the forward curve is saying is what's the point of indifference between these two? So I don't, I'm not gonna cover this here. You can watch my video, but essentially it's saying I could buy the 10 year and in 10 years, buy another 10 year, or I could just buy the 20 year. And the forward curve is saying, what rate in 10 years would you have to be able to get on the 10 year? So you'd be indifferent between the 20 and 10 year. And so obviously, if you invest for 10 years at 156, and you're going to invest another 10 years at some other rate, and you'll end up with 196, then obviously it's got to be higher than 196. Everybody see that? You invest at 156 for 10 years and then another rate for 10 years and you average 196 over that entire time you see how that has to be higher than 196 all right so let's just figure it out one plus that raised the 20th divided by one plus that raised the 10th divided by one divided by 20 minus 10 minus one i did something wrong Divide instead of raising it. Oh, I did. That's still not right. So let's see. Carlos, he's still betting on this, or it might be the parentheses here. Does that look like it could be it? How do we test it? One plus that. To the 20th r one plus that to the 10th that's the first 10 years so after 10 years we'd have 116 742 then what do we do we buy another, another 10 year treasury and what would its yield be it's going to be 236 right so we invest that for another 10 years does it look right See how you're indifferent between the buying the 20 year at 196 or buying the 10 year at 156 if you think you can buy another 10 year at 236 in 10 years. So the bond market is telling us that they think the 10 year treasury will be 2.36% in 10 years. That's the number I mean. You can see how I disagree with them and Darren. Are these two numbers close to each other? Definitely not. It's a big difference in those. So him saying, yeah, the forward card's fine, but they're, they're almost the same number. They're not. There's a good. 80 basis points difference between them, which is going to impact you. All right, so I was probably going to, I'm probably going to use the 236, but you have to discuss it in your paper. Now I have some students see me doing this, and this is how they do their paper. You got to write it as a professional paper. 
with paragraphs and bolding, okay? Make it look very professional. Don't make it look like a homework, homework assignment, okay? Make it look professional. All right, then the market risk premium. So I'm gonna say I'm using the implied approach. Yeah, I don't need a lot of discussion here. I don't mind it. I don't count off in general and in, in real life, you wouldn't do that. But if you wanna just document what the implied means we're saying expected return in stocks should equal required return stocks if markets are efficient that's that's the whole bottom line of the implied approach i can't get the required return i need it but it doesn't exist there's nowhere for me to go pick that up but i have a pretty good sense of what what the expected return in stocks is and it seems logical that if we expect 8%, then that's what investors require. Otherwise, the stock market get repriced until they get what they require. So that's the idea. The implied approach says that the expected return on stocks equals the dividend yield plus expected growth earnings. I gave you a graph on that one if you want to use it. It just shows the stock market over time and shows dividend yield plus expected growth and earnings over time and shows that they're somewhat together until the last few years. Remember the last few years, they got somewhat separated. Then we say expected earnings growth should be a function of expected nominal GDP growth. Makes sense, right? Talk about that. Corporate earnings can't grow 12%. The economy is growing 5%. The economy is growing 5%. Corporate earnings should be, you know, three, four percent. It should be close to that. Expected nominal GDP growth. Anybody remember that formula? What are the components there? Activity growth, plus labor growth. I should have the word expect before that, but plus inflation. And then you have a chart for that. That shows you those three components over time. I'm, now I'm leaving out export imports, but that's that's fine. So you just have to justify that, whatever you think makes sense there. You gotta come with your own numbers, but my numbers would be 2% productivity growth, 1% labor growth, and 2% inflation. But that inflation number is important because I need inflation in the second paper. So I'm gonna keep track of that so I know about it. You're probably gonna get an answer in the four to 6% range. I can't imagine anyone thinking our economy is gonna grow 2%. Now we're talking nominal here, not real. Two to 3% real makes sense, but two to 3% nominal would be absolute disaster. What are you gonna do with inflation? So if you don't think it's transitory, you think we're going back to three to 4% inflation, I just can't believe that because I can't imagine the Fed's gonna let that happen. The Fed's gonna do something to bring that down. And I know President Biden just said that's his top priority now. I'm not sure exactly what the president's gonna do. I'm going to say, hey, stop raising prices. They don't really have that power. Um, they tried it in the seventies, right? And how did that work? can't raise gas prices anymore. And so what did we do? We sat in line at gas stations for three hours waiting for gas. So yeah, you just can't say, hey, don't, don't raise your prices anymore. Okay, president, yeah, we'll do that. We'll lose money in our business, that sounds good. So it's gonna be tough for him to address it. The Federal Reserve definitely can address it, but how do they address it? They address it by slowing everything down. So that's a painful way to address it. All right, so I'm gonna say 5%. We already got the dividend yield. Here's where you can lose a lot of points. So Walmart's dividend yield 
Walmart's dividend yield is 1.47%. SPY we said was what, 1.3%? Which of these numbers do you not need? I give, I'll give you these two numbers on the exam, and there's one of them you ignore and one of them you use. Which, which number do you ignore? Is we're trying to get the expected return on a Walmart or the expected return on the stock market. For paper three, what are you? The implied report. The implied approach has nothing to do with Walmart. The number you use here, you're going to use for every stock, no matter who they are. All right. So this dividend yield is not Walmart's dividend yield. Whose dividend yield is it? The stock market. All right. So we don't want Walmart's dividend. We'll never use Walmart's dividend yield. We need the dividend yield of the stock market. I got that from Yahoo Finance. Now, there's maybe one other adjustment. I like to do 1.5% for what we call stock buybacks. Here's one number I'll let you use, just use it without any research. I put an article out there but there's an argument that firms used to pay back cash, pay out their free cash flow by paying dividends, but now they do dividends and stock buybacks and stock buybacks is actually a bigger number. You just have to trust me on the 1.5%. It comes from a study by Ibbotson. So if you wanna do that, you will get better valuations if you do that. Remember your KE has to be higher than your growth rate. And if your dividend yield is really low, it's going to give you a really low KE. And so adding this extra 1.5% in will help you avoid your KE being too small, right? So that's the reason it could be really helpful. And then we have earnings growth. So there we're using 5%. And so my expected return on stocks going to be the sum of those 1.3 plus 1.5 plus 5. You'll probably get something in the 6 to 9 percent range, probably something closer to 7 to 8. If you just want to be normal, I mean, again, look back at what Damodaran has done. Look at his range. 6 is the lowest on his range and 9. So he's in the 6 to 9 percent range. All right, we'll stop there. We'll, we'll see where we're going, right? I'm writing your paper here. So.